Joining us this morning is Paul Holland, general partner at Foundation Capital, an early Netflix investor, as well as our own Julia Borston. Paul, you're always good at explaining what they're up to, really, uh, and defending them. Is that going to get harder, do you think, in the quarters to come? Uh, well, it's, um, it's, I guess, nice of you to identify and defend them from that perspective. I just simply try to uh, you know, identify to people this very large trend that's happening uh, around media. And, um, you know, you're going to see uh, with a company like a Netflix that's a growth stock, uh, you're going to go kind of, you know, quarter after quarter after quarter that they're going to do great. And then you're going to have some quarters that are going to be a bit of a speed bump or a divot. And, you know, apparently they just uh, went through one of those. Um, uh, but I, I look at the sort of the existential trend, you know, sort of the secular trend. Um, I thought about this when, when, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday when I got the call from you guys. You know, really over the last 50 years, we've seen two kind of huge things impact the media market. We've seen the Internet and we've seen Netflix. And uh, the Netflix story is still unfolding and kind of one quarter doesn't make the story. Julia, I wonder if any analysts or Netflix watchers are talking about just how Netflix handles Q2. I mean, we've wondered this price hike before a weak content quarter. Was that maybe a mistake to do it? I'm, I'm kind of wondering, was it maybe on purpose? So they just know Q2 is often garbage, so why not kitchen sink it? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think, though, that if this had been intentional, John, then they probably would not have forecast that they were going to add 5 million subscribers uh, in yeah. the quarter. There <laughs> certainly was an element of surprise for Netflix itself. But I think one thing that's interesting as we look going forward, what happened in Q2 and what could happen in the second half of the year, is one analyst, the Morgan Stanley analyst, said they're less concerned about the loss of shows like Netflix and The Office from the platform, and they're more concerned about the challenge of making sure they find new hits like Stranger Things, because the model for Netflix seems to be shifting, and subscriber additions are really all about having those big flagship shows that can bring people onto the platform. Paul, is that part of the risk here when you look at Netflix, losing some of these legacy shows like Friends or, or like The Office? Yes, that frees up money for them to spend more on their own original content, but creating hits can be, well, hit or miss. Yeah, I think there's always going to be the risk of that, right? I mean, Netflix made a huge uh, shift over, you know, five or six years ago in terms of, you know, the focus on original content. Obviously, they've been rewarded, uh, you know, orders of magnitude in terms of uh, increase in, in the value of the company and their ability to have an impact by going out and doing even more of the original content. But I, uh, but I would point out something I think it's kind of interesting, and I, I, I unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm the oldest person on this uh, interaction here, but... For any of us that remember what it used to be like when you would take old shows like The Office or Friends into syndication, you know, I remember <laughs> Cheers when I was kind of in my 20s. It was considered sort of the also-rans, the leftovers, eh, whatever, you know, people will bid for it. It'll show up on some Channel 85, you know, on, on UHF, you know, I'm using terms that don't exist anymore. <laughs> but, um, but I think that's sort of the way it used to be, and I think at some point, or at some level, you have to almost look at the value of the leftovers of The Office and Friends as almost like an homage to Netflix. Look at the amount of value that was created around that content. Um, and, you know, so I think, but I think your fundamental point is, is, is certainly accurate here. Um, they need to be in a position to continue to innovate. And when we look at companies like this and say, okay, they're in this big, huge rush over a multi-year trend, can they keep kind of going back to the well and coming up with new ideas, new concepts, even new frameworks around their business. And the thing that we always look for there is the strength and the ingenuity of the management team. And as you guys have heard me say many times, this, I think, is the strongest management team in the United States today and the strongest CEO. So, you know, we continue to have faith in, uh, in the fact that they're going to find ways to be able to innovate. And Netflix is just one of those companies that every quarter there's some new, you know, dire prediction. Uh, it's, oh, Apple's in the business, Disney's in the business, so-and-so's doing this. It used to be Blockbuster and Walmart. You know, these guys are, are very, very strong. Uh, they stub their toe a bit. They'll come back from it. Uh, I, I, I have no concerns about kind of the long term here with Netflix.